When I initially planned to play through Live Alive on a recommendation, the most incredible coincidence happened. This decades-old game that had never even been localized was slated for a Switch remake. It wasn't just getting ported, it was getting a full rework, complete with a renewed version of its OST, voice acting for the first time in both English and Japanese, and a fresh coat of paint. I thought this must be some sort of sign. I had to schedule in the original Live Alive as soon as possible so that I could approach its remake with a better eye for detail and more appreciation. I had little clue that the game had long before been something of a cult classic. I probably should have guessed as much. It was, after all, the inspiration for Toby Fox's most famous song, Megalovania. Where there was no localization, dedicated fans had patched in their own translations, making it playable to English speakers. Thanks to this broader availability, a whole host of people crawled out of the woodwork at the announcement of the remake to declare how excited they were, because they'd played it when they were younger, or because they had been waiting for the chance to play it for the first time. Impressed by this response, I went into the game with rapt attention, ready to see what it was that made this game so special to so many people. It's more complicated, I think, than simply saying it was a good game. I can honestly say after playing it that I've probably never seen another game like it. That may seem like an awfully heavy and definitive statement to make. What makes it so unique? To start with, it has so much going on that summarizing its premise without spoiling any major twists can be a bit difficult. Live Alive presents the uninitiated player with seven chapters, all completely distinct from one another. Each chapter focuses on a different character in a different time period. A boy from the Stone Age, an elderly kung fu master in Imperial China, a ninja from the Bakumatsu period, a Wild West cowboy, a modern-day wrestler, a teenager with psychic powers, and a little robot from far in the future. Each story is self-contained and playable within several hours at most, and each fits a different genre. Episodic as they are, they seem to be entirely unrelated, and may lead one to wonder what inspired the game to be structured this way. In truth, the stories may be very different, but as you navigate each of them, the discerning player might begin to notice similar elements. For one thing, short and simple as each chapter is, they seem to be saying almost the same thing. Humanity remains unchanged over the eons. There will be struggles brought about by nature and by people motivated by power and greed. However, these things can be overcome because there will always be people who carry the desire to do good. Even when there is a note of uncertainty, there is always hope. In and of itself, I could see this connection marking the game as a worthwhile use of your time. What stood out to me more after just a couple of chapters, though, was the fact that all of the villains have the Odi sound somewhere in their name. Odo, the last living dinosaur whose wrath can only be quelled by human sacrifice. Odi Wan Lee, the leader of a growing martial arts school who uses his students to rob and bully civilians. Ode Io, a greedy daimyo who would see Japan plunged headlong into another civil war. Odio, a bandit who strong arms villagers out of their livelihoods. Odio Bright, a fighter whose determination to be the best has driven him to murder. Odeo, an evil deity awakened by the sacrifice of thousands of people. And Od Ten, a rogue AI who has determined that humans cannot be trusted with self-determination. Their motivations are all quite distinct, as you can tell, so why the shared naming scheme? I wondered whether it was meant to tie itself to the Latin root for hate in Romance languages, odium, or whether there was some deeper meaning that would reveal itself as I progressed through the chapters. Ultimately, both answers ended up being correct. The bosses are all meant to invoke the word hate, and there is an answer that the player can only discover after all seven chapters have been beaten. It lies within a secret eighth chapter that unravels the story of Orsted, a champion knight during the medieval period in the fictional kingdom of Lucrece. Orsted seems to have everything he could want in his position. He's just won a tournament that guarantees him the hand of the king's daughter in marriage, as well as the lasting admiration of everyone in the kingdom, even the lasting friendship of his rival in that tournament, Strabo. His career is settled and his future looks bright. Then, his new wife, Princess Alethea, is suddenly kidnapped by a powerful sorcerer going by the simple and on-the-nose title of the Lord of Dark. Orsted is tasked by the king to rescue her, and in order to do so, he calls on the help of the men who vanquished the last Lord of Dark, a warrior who has become a cynical recluse, Hash, and a monk called Uranus. Hash initially refuses to help Orsted, and it is only with Uranus' assistance that he is able to convince the jaded older man to lend his aid. Hash doesn't do so without a warning, though. Though the people laud Orsted for his heroism now, they will forget about him when they no longer need him. Heroes are only loved when they are needed. Orsted has no reaction to his opinion. Players will note that the strangest thing about Orsted thus far is that he's an entirely silent protagonist. Even Oboromaru and Sundown, who are soft-spoken, have opinions to express once in a while, and though Cube can't speak human languages, they communicate with animated beeps and dial-up noises. 
Orsted says nothing at all. He is pulled along on a perilous journey to save his wife-to-be, whom he barely knows, and through all the trials and tribulations the group faces, one may think that he has no opinions. Or maybe they don't notice, or maybe they think he's meant to be a vessel for players to project onto. I thought it was strange, but couldn't determine the reason for it. Even when Hash and Strabo are killed, when he is tormented by illusions of the Lord of Dark that cause him to lash out and murder the king, even when he flees for his life and Uranus is imprisoned under suspicions of collusion, he doesn't even have an internal monologue to express his grief. This is what makes the end of the chapter come as a shock. There is a point where Orsted can't take it anymore. All of his comrades are gone, and it is by himself that he makes it to the Lord of Dark's lair, prepared to vanquish him. For redemption in the eyes of his people? For revenge? Because there's still a part of him that believes the kingdom deserves to be saved in spite of its rejection of him? Maybe all of these play a part, but he remembers Uranus warning him that no matter how much he suffers, he can't give in to hatred. He must keep believing that humans are worth saving. He remembers the little boy he encountered in a village who was certain that the hero Orsted couldn't have killed the king, the sole person who still believes in him now. And then he finds out that the Lord of Dark is none other than his friend Strabo. Strabo had long been envious of Orsted, who remained one step ahead of him in every respect. Tired of always losing to him, Strabo became the Lord of Dark and vowed to ruin Orsted's life, as he believed Orsted had ruined his. And ruin it he did. He kidnapped Alethea, then accompanied Orsted on his quest under the guise of helping him and feigned his death in the same cave-in that killed Hash. He created a series of illusions to drive an already upset Orsted mad with fear, including one that disguised the king as the Lord of Dark so that Orsted would kill him. Orsted became a wanted fugitive with no one to support him, and now he learns that even the friend he thought he'd lost was not only alive, but had hated him for a long time. When he fights and defeats Strabo, there is no joy in his victory. The final straw is that the very woman he was sent to rescue chastises him for winning. Sure, Strabo committed evil deeds and kidnapped her, but she argues that he was the only one who seemed to care and acted like he truly loved her. It was unfair of Orsted to never let him enjoy a single triumph. Then, deciding that she has nothing left to live for, she kills herself. Orsted has now lost his wife on top of his friends, his home, and the support of his people. It is he who has nothing left to live for. This is when Orsted finally speaks, just so that he can express his hatred of his fellow humans. Hash was right. Humanity wasn't worth saving. People's opinions of him did a heel turn overnight, and no one made an effort to find out the truth of what happened. His friends all died or betrayed him. He has no one to love him and no one to love in turn. He concludes that a species as fickle as this has no right to exist, and in his boundless hatred, he will ensure that they are erased. He takes the mantle of the Lord of Dark himself, and with it he adopts a new name, Odio. In other words, every villain the player and their various heroes have had to fight up to that point were the vestiges of Odio's hatred, spread throughout space and time. It doesn't end with them defeating those antagonists either. Odio himself is still alive, and he is still angry. At this point, the player is directed to select a protagonist again. You can choose whoever you want, including Orsted. If you select Orsted, you will be subjected to a boss rush with another twist. You play as the bosses themselves. You may note that every boss battle is in fact easier this way. It turns out that the only thing that keeps bosses from curb stomping you with ease is the fallibility of AI. Should you begin to lose any of these battles, another ending will be triggered in which Orsted self-destructs, and forces all the other bosses to do the same. The sheer destructive power of these explosions is enough to wipe out humanity and create Armageddon, leaving behind nothing. Should Orsted win each of these battles, though, the outcome isn't much better. With every hero dead, humanity has veered so far off course that it has ceased to exist. Orsted is left to ponder the meaning of his victory in an empty world, undying and completely alone. Of course, the intended path is opened by picking any of the other seven protagonists. After each hero's victory over their version of Odio, they are transported to the Dominion of Hate, the now-empty kingdom of Lucrece suspended in time. The player, controlling their chosen hero, must find the rest of the heroes scattered throughout the land and recruit them with the joint aim of finding a way back home. Together, the party must navigate various trials and ultimately find their way to the Lord of Dark's lair in order to challenge him, dodging distorted enemies from throughout the timeline along the way. There are almost no differences between the original story and the one in the remake. This is, in my opinion, for the better. The age-old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, applies to remakes of video games, and should be taken into account when looking at which aspects should be improved and which aspects should be left the way they are. Failing to do so could tank the quality of the game, as some have complained Square Enix did with the remake of Final Fantasy VII. Although virtually every other part of the game was dated, and there was of course the issue of no official translation existing, the story itself remained faithful to what was published over 20 years ago. The only major exception occurs at the very end of the game. 
In the original game, the true ending could be reached when the main hero and their party initially defeated Odio. Afterwards, Odio tells the heroes to finish him off. Fulfilling his request brings about a bad ending. What's supposed to happen instead is the heroes refusing to kill him and turning their backs on him to leave. Once inside the room with statues fashioned after each character's respective final boss, Odio will reappear and declare that the fight isn't over, then use his magic to teleport everyone back into those boss battles. When all seven of those are won once again, he collapses, his magic spent, and his senses return to him. Orsted has a warning to give the heroes before he dies. Anyone can succumb to hatred if they're not careful. Greed, resentment, and all other such negative emotions are an intrinsic part of humanity that can bring out the worst in people if allowed to fester. Difficult though it may be to remember in the face of adversity, Orsted's warning is a reminder that cynicism in unhealthy amounts can cause one to become disconnected from humans entirely. In the remake, however, the boss rush isn't the end. Overwhelmed by the hatred possessing him, Odio morphs into a giant enemy never seen before, resembling a massive suit of armor held together by seething threads of magma. The head appears to shed tears, and at the heart, held in place by a tangle of arteries, is a seemingly unconscious Orsted. To accompany the gravity of this reveal, a brand new orchestral remaster of the standard boss track Megalomania, called Gigalomania, plays. The player is no longer relegated to their selected party of four for the entire battle, either. Part of the way through, everyone will jump in to lend a hand, and the final blow is struck by none other than Orsted himself, having torn free of the hatred binding him in both a physical and figurative sense. He issues the same warning that he did before to the player, but has a longer and more emotional monologue to go along with it. Horrified by what he has done, he curses his own weakness of spirit, and urges the heroes to never forget the seed of darkness that sleeps within them. Live Alive's message is nothing particularly revolutionary. It is, in my opinion, a very simple good versus evil conflict. These fell out of favor as complicated narratives in video games became more popular. Many people thought it more interesting to communicate themes in terms of moral grayness, or to go the infamous way of Shin Megami Tensei and creating the Order vs. Chaos binary instead. But I don't think an old-fashioned good versus evil narrative is all that bad. In this case, it is interesting for a few reasons. The first is that the story goes in a direction you are not equipped to expect at all. The second is that it doesn't argue that there are necessarily inherently evil people, rather, people are motivated to do evil deeds by emotions like hatred. Orsted was a good man who simply couldn't bear the pain of losing everything he had. The moral of his story is that under certain circumstances, anyone could become like him. It's easy to see why this game was already a classic, but I think that the remake's spin on the ending made it still more impactful. Even without admiring the aesthetics and taking in the phenomenal OST, this final fight adds something that the original lacked. It is crucial that Orsted is the one to ultimately defeat Odio, that is, the darkness within himself. This way, it's not only a story about heroes overcoming evil, it's a story about finding one's own strength of will and purging the evil within oneself. The distinction here is important because it makes Orsted's story more than a cautionary tale. It takes on a more empowering note. Just as people can do evil under the right circumstances, people can also atone for what evil they've committed and choose to do good. So what are the other chapters? They do make up the bulk of the game, after all. For a while, I wasn't sure how to tackle reviewing them. As I mentioned before, they are all short and sweet, all have a similar underlying theme, and occupy very different genres and have very different modes of gameplay. To an extent, people's chapter preferences may just come down to a matter of taste. Still, I decided it's only fair that I give a brief overview of my thoughts on each chapter, narratively and mechanically, because there are strengths and weaknesses evident in them that I feel are worth mentioning. I also decided that the best, or maybe just the most fun way to do this was to rank them. So, here is my chapter-by-chapter -chapter review of Live Alive, from the most meh to the most wow segments of the game. This seems almost unfair given the kind of chapter the present-day chapter is. It's the best way to get used to the game's combat mechanics because it's all combat. The main character, an aspiring fighter called Masaru, must do battle with the world's best martial artists and wrestlers in order to become the very best, like no one ever was. His only dialogue with his opponents is short and succinct, and he doesn't have much in the way of backstory either. Basically, if you're here to learn the essentials of fighting in this game, it's a good place to start. If you're here expecting a compelling story, it's a big fat nothing burger. The only story to speak of is at the end, when Masaru must confront another powerful fighter, Odio Bright, who believes that the only way to stand at the top of the pack is to kill everyone who stands in your way. As a chapter that is essentially a boss rush, it distinguishes itself not just by being your teacher for combat, but by giving Masaru the unique ability to copy his opponent's moves after being hit by them. 
This is admittedly cool and something I'm glad that the remake tells you about up front. It becomes obvious more quickly that way that the way to beat the chapter is by stealing moves from certain enemies first and using them to counter more difficult opponents as you become stronger. Besides being more intuitive, the chapter is flat out easier on account of buffs to Masaru's skills. Now, his self-heal is sufficient to actually let him survive a few hits. The original chapter could be frustrating on account of how squishy he was, but at least you could and still can save between matches, provided you remember to, that is. Another thing to remember, which new players would have no idea about, is the fact that once you conclude a match with Masaru, you can't go back and get any moves you might have missed. In other words, if you want all of an opponent's moves, or at least their best ones, Masaru has to wait to be hit by them before you can proceed to defeat them. This can actually be more difficult than a straightforward fight to win at times. Masaru must be kept alive and take a good deal of punishment before scoring that final KO. Some people may not see the point in bothering with this, only to get to the Dominion of Hate and realize that Masaru would be better with this move or that move. I can't warn players who are avoiding spoilers to invest in Masaru if they want him in their final party, but I can say to players who understand the struggle that this chapter was basically something I did just to get through it. This is one of the game's more involved chapters. You are a boy called Pogo. Your best friend is a gorilla called Gori. You live happily with your clan in a cave network, hunting and gathering and doing all those things that hunter-gatherers do, and you have just come of age. In order to win your clan's respect and gain a place among its hard-working adults, you must go out with your gorilla buddy and bring back some fresh meat to prove that you can provide for your fellows. What a simple life. Basically, all Pogo or any of the cavemen have to worry about on a daily basis is food. That is, until Pogo finds a woman hiding in a haystack in one of the commune's caves. The woman is called Beru, and she changes the trajectory of Pogo's life in a big way. Not only is she not supposed to be there, since she's not part of the clan, but she is in fact on the run from her own home. It turns out that one of the neighboring clans had her slated for human sacrifice, and they're not happy that their fresh meat has escaped. Pogo's attempts to hide her, and then to protect her when the cultist clan comes knocking to see if she's found shelter here, almost ignite a much larger conflict and make basically everyone else involved angry. He, Gori, and Beru are unceremoniously booted from the clan and left to wander in the wilderness for their troubles. With nothing to protect them, they're an easy target for ambush. Beru gets kidnapped again, and Pogo and Gori must go to rescue her, and in doing so face not just the cultists, but a much more terrifying threat, the being they worship as a deity, the last living dinosaur. The prehistory chapter frames the story as the ultimate man versus nature conflict, with the stakes being the birth of civilization itself. Mankind cannot exist in harmony with such an enormous and bloodthirsty predator, so it has to be brought down in order for people to exist and propagate freely. You have to suspend your disbelief, obviously, but making the crux of the conflict over humanity's future an all-out battle waged with a dinosaur is objectively pretty cool. It also frames Pogo's coming of age as a microcosm of humanity's own growth. Just as Pogo has gone from boy to man, humanity has risen to become the ultimate apex predator, standing at the top of the food chain and flourishing from then on. Another thing that I liked about it was that it managed to convey a surprising amount of information with no dialogue. It's not that Pogo was a silent protagonist like Orsted, it's that language just hasn't been invented yet, so all of the cavemen communicate with each other via grunts and shouts and pictures. I thought this was a remarkably clever workaround to solving the issue of not knowing just how cavemen communicated without a written history. The story doesn't need elegant prose to get across what it's trying to say. This is helped further by the addition of voice acting in the remake, so the character's emotions can actually be heard. It's the show-don't-tell principle taken to the extreme without being overly pretentious. In fact, there's virtually no pretension to be found in this chapter at all, though this raises an issue I have with it. It is in many ways comedic, but it wants you to sit through so, so many poop jokes. No, I don't expect that pre-civilization societies were all that concerned with decorum. I bet they had their fair share of fart jokes. But after having Pogo and Gori learn a bunch of moves associated with various bodily functions and a running gag about how much Gori farts, I was a little bit tired of it. Lack of dialogue makes for limited joke material, but enough of that childish humor made it hard for me to take the chapter seriously at all. I noted too that however gross Pogo and Gori got to be, Beru remained above having bodily functions because everyone knows that women don't fart. She was the center of some very stereotypical suggestive 90s gags in which she, as a beautiful woman, was able to get Pogo to do whatever she wanted by kissing him or even flashing her boobs. A class act, to be sure. 
On a somewhat related note, every hero gets a unique ability, so whereas Masaru's was his passive copycat behavior, Pogo's is a very strong sense of smell. The player can get a sense of where they're going by sniffing around and seeing which direction particular scent clouds come from. This can assist with hunting for certain objectives and finding your way out of an especially dark cave, but it doesn't really have much wider applicability and makes Pogo a somewhat weak pick for the final chapter's party. What I thought was cooler about this chapter was that you're able to craft equipment by picking up materials through battle or exploration. At a relatively early level, you can make some pretty strong stuff just by finding the right combination of rocks, sticks, bones, and other minutiae. You can only do that in this chapter, though the near future chapter does let you upgrade certain items you find. All in all, I don't think it's a bad chapter. Most of the time, it's not too rough to play through or difficult to navigate, and the story isn't bad even if the humor is kind of annoying. However, it and its characters are nothing especially remarkable. It's fine, but I think it's far from the best that Live Alive has to offer. I'm a fan of Cowboys, so I was excited to see what the game's take on the Wild West would be. It starts as you'd expect. A lone wanderer, name unknown, moseys into town and walks into a bar. Somehow, he ends up getting roped into an incident. A stranger with bad intentions rolls in to threaten the townspeople, and this quiet, vaguely intimidating hombre has to step in to help. He may have a bounty on his head and no place to call home, but rest assured, deep beneath that poncho, he has a heart of gold. In this respect, the Wild West chapter doesn't really depart much from this formula. Our protagonist, the enigmatic Sundown Kid, is even directly confronted by the hunter chasing his bounty, a man called Mad Dog. What makes this chapter interesting is that the two of them must ultimately set aside their differences because the town is set to be attacked by a group of bandits called the Crazy Bunch the next morning, and they don't have enough manpower to defend themselves. It's not in either man's nature to shrug off a sincere request for help. So how are two honest gunslingers going to stand up to a gang more than a dozen strong? Obviously, conventional methods aren't going to work. Instead, the game has you, with the help of Mad Dog, run around the town looking for items that can be used to make traps. If you find the right combinations of useful tools, you can enlist the townspeople to construct the perfect ambush, greatly thinning out the crazy bunch's numbers and turning the showdown with their leader, Odeo, into a perfectly fair two-on-one fight. Your time is limited, though. You have the duration of the night to get everything you need, and outside of the game, that doesn't translate to very long at all. Mechanically, this chapter is probably the most interesting. There isn't any way to get a bad ending outside of simply failing to beat Odeo, no matter how many bandits he has left. How easy that fight ends up being comes down to how quickly the player can run around town gathering everything they need, which you have around 15 minutes to do. In the original game, this was much harder. Not only was finding and distributing trap items less intuitive, but the passage of time was marked only by the sound of the eight bells that marked each in-game hour. The remake added a helpful meter of light that depletes as your time runs out, and on top of that, Mad Dog offers extra tips about who can use certain items in cases where it's not immediately obvious. Either way, though, it's still possible to simply save before heading out on your time-sensitive mission. As long as you remember not to overwrite that save, you can make the last battle pretty easy for yourself. The nature of this chapter being limited to one battle after a short runaround means that it doesn't have a lot of time to build its narrative. There's definitely something to be desired after the fact, but one thing that still renders it capable of leaving an impression is the character of Sundown himself. It is revealed that when Sundown initially created a reputation for himself as the fastest gunslinger in the West, he attracted the attention of people who wanted to challenge him. Eventually, this brought a whole gang of bandits to a small town who ended up destroying it in their rampage. He, the sole survivor, was left with no home, no family, and nothing but a bad reputation and a horse to take him somewhere he can die peacefully. It's a mystery as to whether it's guilt or the remains of his good faith that allow him to help others, but the most interesting part is that he keeps escaping Mad Dog's attempts to kill him. What motivates him to do so? In the end, this survival instinct can be resolved by the player in one of two ways. Run from Mad Dog's demand for a duel and keep being chased by him to the ends of the earth, or accept it and kill him to ride off a free man. The game doesn't qualify either of these endings as a good or bad ending, but the more satisfying one, in my opinion, is the one that keeps Mad Dog alive, even if it means Sundown must continue to run from his past. Oh, and Odeo? Yeah, he was actually a horse the whole time. It was hatred that turned him into what he was, which can be read as foreshadowing for Orsted slash Odeo's role in the story, but wasn't entirely appropriate for the Western genre. Between that, the narrative's limited nature and virtually non-existent opportunities to level up, and the fact that the SNES version is mechanically really annoying, I didn't end up liking it as much as I thought I would, though it certainly wasn't bad. It's not so far off that technology is truly cutting edge, but far enough away that you'll find a stereotypical mad scientist straight out of Back to the Future. 
Akira is a psychic teenage orphan named after a manga-turned-movie about another psychic teenage orphan, and he has roughly the exact attitude you'd expect him to have. Lazy, crass, and irritable, Akira spends his days however he likes, no matter whom it inconveniences. His only soft spots are for his little sister, the orphanage he lives at and its inhabitants, and the man who looks after him like an older brother, a slick biker named Matsu, or Lawless in the remake. Although the two couldn't be any more different in outward attitude, he admires Matsu and is determined to tag along whenever Matsu helps other people. This ends up landing him right in the midst of a conspiracy of unimaginable proportions. When one of his fellow orphans is kidnapped, he and Matsu ride off to save the day, only to find out via Akira's telepathy that this kidnapping is just one small link in a great chain of disappearances. This masked gang called the Crusaders has been abducting people and taking them to a research facility on the outskirts of town, Tsukuba Lab. The two find out after infiltrating the place that the kidnapped victims are liquefied, but their consciousness is maintained so that their hatred and other negative emotions can be used to awaken a powerful entity. Conveniently, the bad guys aren't the only ones with a mad scientist on their side. Akira is friends with a squat and eccentric inventor called Dr. Toei, who has been developing his magnum opus mostly behind the scenes. The Steel Titan, a giant mech suit that can only be safely piloted with psychic powers. Deep beneath his cluttered antique shop, the Steel Titan slumbers. The only problem is that Akira, when he first visits it, does not have what it takes to awaken and control it, much to Toei's disappointment. This changes after Akira and Matsu's visit to Tsukuba Lab. In retaliation for their antics, the Crusaders burn down the orphanage. Akira returns to see the building in flames and its residents panicking, as the caretaker, Taiko, and his little sister, Kaori, are still trapped inside. Akira rushes in to save them without a second thought. This move may have come at the cost of his own life, but at the last minute, a savior crashes through the crumbling ceiling, the Steel Titan itself powered by none other than Matsu. Though Matsu has no psychic powers to speak of, through sheer force of will and a special substance, he was able to make it move, though at a great cost. His energy ultimately ends up spent, and he lays dying in Akira's arms, having done everything he could to save the remaining orphanage residents. His last thoughts are a torrent of regret, not at his death, but at the fact that he was once a part of the Crusaders when they were little more than an ordinary biker gang, and it was he who took the life of Akira's father, a policeman. He wanted to do everything he could to help Akira and Kaori grow up safely as a way of atoning for taking their parent away, even if it meant they would hate him for it. The surge of emotions that course through Akira after all that just happened are what finally allows him to take charge of the Steel Titan. The only thing left for him to do at that point is pilot it towards Tsukuba Lab's next objective, a remote temple where they plan to use all 2,000 liquefied humans to summon a powerful deity called Odeo into the temple's great Inko statue. There isn't much in the way of falling action after this climactic battle. Akira emerges victorious, the vast pool of human soup consumes the men behind its creation, and things go pretty much back to normal as the credits roll over footage of him riding Matsu's motorcycle. I have to be honest when I say that after all of the build-up to that point, the ending had me asking, that's it? There's a lot of good in this chapter, but there's also a lot going on in it to begin with. For those unfamiliar with the tokusatsu genre and its flagship franchises like Godzilla or Kamen Rider, it may seem overwhelming, difficult to follow, or just plain strange. An aspect that is almost entirely irrelevant to the main plot, for example, is Akira's attempt to save Kaori's pet turtle, Tarokichi, by bringing the sick reptile to Dr. Toei. He is able to keep Tarokichi alive by giving him cybernetic enhancements that probably cross all kinds of ethical boundaries, and calls the new cyborg Taroimo, who becomes a recruitable party member and fights alongside Akira as thanks for saving his life. This doesn't have much of anything to do with, well, anything, but it gives Akira more fighting power. It's one of several elements that may have players asking what the point of all that was, but the answer is not to worry about it. It's tokusatsu, and sometimes tokusatsu is just like that. As with any other sci-fi, it's more generous to suspend one's disbelief. Aside from other somewhat noxious 90s action hero sexism that gets smoothed out in the remake, the chapter is pretty entertaining. The fact that it's a wild ride will only heighten the appeal for some, even if I don't think it's for everyone. What mattered to me was ultimately that first, it was just fun, and second, that it did a good job with its characters. Characters. Although basically the only two characters that get much of an arc are Akira and Matsu, the chapter puts a lot of its energy into building the relationship between them, contextualizing Akira's behavior, and ensuring that players really feel the loss of Matsu just as much as Akira does. It pulls a lot of weight, too, by examining the conflict between people's perceptions of others and who those people really are. 
Akira's ability to read minds is a window just past the facade others project. As he juggles threats to the orphanage and tries to protect what's important to him, he has to reevaluate what it means to be the hero of justice he believed his dad to be, whether Matsu can still live up to that reputation as his father's murderer, and whether he himself is capable of enough good to take up that mantle. I also enjoyed playing through this chapter because it was mechanically one of the ones that was most like a standard RPG. Fight enemies, level up, get new abilities. There's an overworld map of the town that Akira navigates whenever he's not inside a building, which got an impressive and helpful amount of detail in the remake. Additionally, he can find various parts and objects that he can bring to Dr. Toei for an upgrade. Not all items are upgradable, but you won't lose the ones that aren't by having him check. For those used to this sort of gameplay, you're not likely to get lost because of how straightforward the chapter is, though there may be things you miss. What you don't get told at any point is that Akira is the only character whose equipment and inventory are vital to maintain for the finale. The machine parts he finds can be used to upgrade Cube, and he also has access to a unique and powerful weapon that Cube can use, but only if the player remembers to have it on him before they end the chapter. It is at least courteous enough to tell you when the point of no return is, but those with no awareness of the finale chapter might find a couple of their favorites kneecap because they're missing something Akira could have gotten. The primary reason I don't rank this chapter higher is because because I happened to like the remaining chapters more. The other reason is that despite everything, tokusatsu just isn't a genre that appeals to me personally. Though I respect it, I feel others might think this chapter deserves more credit because they got more personal enjoyment out of it than I did, which is fine. If nothing else, it was a lot of fun, and I thought it was a neat love letter to its genre. Avid sci-fi fans might be able to spot a lot of pop culture references peppered throughout the scenery, with the most obvious one being Dr. Toei. Though named Dr. Tobei in the remake, Toei is the name of one of Japan's first ever film companies and the foremost producer of tokusatsu in Japan today. It's incredibly out there, fast-paced, and jam-packed with things that will either delight or confuse you, but the amount you like it may ultimately be determined by your familiarity with a lot of its inspirations. People who know of my interest in Japanese history might be surprised to see that the chapter where you play as a shinobi around the time of the Meiji Restoration isn't far and away my favorite. It's kind of a mixed bag for me, but I'll go into that in a second. The protagonist, Oboromaru, is cool as a cucumber, the spitting image of what popular mythology surrounding ninja makes them out to be. As you'd expect, his job is a dangerous one. He must infiltrate the castle of Ode Io, who has no intention of abiding by the shogunate's desire for peaceful relationships with other countries. If it were up to him, Japan would be the way it was a few hundred years ago during the Sengoku period. Domains constantly at each other's throats, fighting an endless battle to see who was the strongest, all for the amusement of nobility like himself. For that purpose, he's been holding a key peacekeeper prisoner, whom Oboromaru must rescue. The details of the rescue are left to Oboromaru's discretion. He can choose to bloody his hands, or he can choose to be as stealthy as possible to avoid conflict. This means that by extension, the player can choose to either kill every grunt who stands in their way, or sneak around and flee from every encounter. The intuitive way to play this chapter is casually. Kill the soldiers who try to catch you, but avoid trouble otherwise. Your only focus should be your ultimate objective anyway, right? Wrong. It's not that simple, and I'm somewhat glad to have been told before starting this chapter that I should make a point not to kill anyone. Killing outside of mandatory boss battles when it's convenient or seems necessary is definitely the easy way to go. You get as much XP as you feel like you need, and you don't have to worry so much about sneaking around. But the game offers you a choice to go one of two less intuitive roads, the path of the pacifist or the path of the unrepentant murderer. The former is self-explanatory. Outside of scripted boss battles, kill absolutely no one and run when someone attacks you. The latter requires you to kill as many people as possible. There are a hundred people in Ode Io's castle, foot soldiers, nobles, courtesans, and servants alike. You must kill every single one of them, sparing absolutely no one, not even non-combatants. But wait, doesn't that sound like... Yes, this chapter is where the game's direct inspiration of Undertale becomes more apparent. If you're among the minority of internet dwellers who has somehow never played Undertale, I'll say that without spoiling anything major, there are three main endings. A neutral ending, in which the player treats the game as a standard RPG and kills only when convenient. A bad ending, in which the player goes out of their way to kill every other character and a good ending, consider the true ending in which the player kills no one. During what's called a genocide run, the player character keeps track of their kills in each area by saying how many living creatures are left. In Live Alive, whenever Oborumaru makes a kill, he counts it. The amount that these characters dirty their hands is significant to the point each narrative is ultimately making. I will say that you don't get a bad ending if you decide to go scorched earth on Ode Io's castle and massacre everyone inside. 
The only way to get a bad ending is if you abandon the castle, thereby forfeiting your status as a shinobi and going on the run before ultimately getting killed by a former comrade. Otherwise, Oboromaru is still a participant in the final chapter, a hero who must prevent humanity from being destroyed. It's just that you get the best possible ending if you stay your hand. Additionally, whereas a pacifist run in Undertale is much easier than a genocide run, both these endings in the Edo chapter are about equally frustrating to get. It's as much of a pain as it sounds like to track down every single person in the castle to kill them, but it's also frustrating not to kill enemies because you get no XP or other rewards and thus level up much, much more slowly. His special skill allows him to stand perfectly still and camouflage himself when enemies are nearby, making it easier to avoid fights, and there are means of getting some levels by fighting ghosts who are already dead and don't count as kills, but it is likely that Oboromaru will encounter unavoidable boss fights in the chapter underleveled and outmatched, which will greatly hamper your progress in reaching the end. The rewards of a no-kill run are considerable, however. For one thing, Oboromaru will receive the most powerful sword he can obtain, the Mutsu no Kami. For another, you'll get access to the best ending, in which Oboromaru is able to properly talk to the prisoner he broke out. The man in question is none other than Ryoma Sakamoto, one of the Edo period's most famous patriots, credited with a good deal of mediation, peacekeeping, and modernization that led Japan to become what it is now. He will offer Oboromaru the chance to work alongside him with the goal of creating a peaceful future. It makes no difference how the player chooses to respond because Oboromaru comes away from the interaction with his outlook changed regardless. After seeing the tumult of his times, he is able to look to the future with hope. This is a resolution to a question that comes up repeatedly throughout the chapter, not always posed directly to Oboromaru but discussed in detail. What will happen to Japan? Foreign forces are looming at their doorstep, the samurai are no longer unified in their purpose, and the people clamor for a central power to reassure them. Bloodshed is inevitable, but must it continue? Or can the people of Japan finally embrace change as it comes and enjoy a lasting peace? Oboromaru's method of interacting with others can be read as a microcosm of the conflict Japan faces during the Bakumatsu period. The way he chooses to handle his encounters ultimately affects his outlook towards the violence breaking out across the country. There is an irony in using violence to free one of the nation's key peacemakers, suggesting that Oboromaru has no reason to care, or perhaps has resolved not to concern himself with, the problems that don't directly involve him. If he's killed everyone, there is also the question of what separates him from Ode Io at that point. Is being a shinobi an outlet for violent impulses? Is he venting his frustrations about the winds of change on ordinary people because his purpose may soon be snatched from him? This uncertainty mirrors the very uncertainty of a Japan mired in conflict between nationalist groups, the government, and foreign emissaries. The way that he is ultimately able to cling to hope is by determining himself what is right and just, whether he decides to wield his blade with sound judgment as a shinobi, or whether he decides to move on to bigger things alongside a legend in the making. My mixed feelings on this chapter ultimately come from the fact that it was really annoying to play through. It should be noted that on the SNES version, there is no map. The lack of this single element makes navigating the chapter that much harder, especially because the castle is littered with traps. Step on a certain tile or enter a wrong door and you may find yourself in a completely different area that you can't turn back from. Taking the long way to figure out where you're supposed to be is as little fun as you'd expect, especially if you're trying to dodge enemies along the way. The incorporation of a map in the remake alone makes getting around much easier, though the chapter is still probably the longest, and the traps or your chosen method of gameplay can make it the most tedious. Although there is no right order in which to play the game's chapters, I wouldn't recommend that players choose this one first on account of its difficulty. It's a good story, but it is ultimately held back from being the best one in my opinion by aspects that make it take way longer than it needs to. The Imperial China chapter seems to take its inspiration from popular kung fu movies, though from the perspective of the mentor. The protagonist, simply called the Earthen Heart Shifu, is an aging man who practices a rare kind of kung fu that would be lost if he were to die. Knowing this, he decides to seek out a student to inherit his style, and perhaps even start a school to carry on the traditions he's dedicated his life to. To that end, he descends from his reclusive abode on a mountain to the nearest town, where he finds not just one promising pupil, but three. A spunky bandit named Lei Kugo, a poor young man without the money to sate his ravenous hunger, Hong Haka, and a boy named Yun Zhou, who lacks skill but makes up for it with determination and integrity. 
The first part of the chapter is dedicated to training these students in a series of sparring sessions. The Shifu will fight the students repeatedly in order to teach them new moves and increase their levels. The player is at liberty to decide how they want to train their students and what equipment to give them. For some people, myself included, the sensible thing to do would seem to be to train all of the students equally so that there's an even distribution of levels. I was told not to do this and instead to focus on training one student, but I wasn't told why. It turns out that this chapter subverts any expectations you may have about your student's growth in a big way. In preventing a robbery in the town, the Shifu makes an enemy of a growing martial arts school that prizes strength above everything else, led by O.D. Wan Lee. The school's members get their revenge by ambushing the Shifu's school while he's away on an errand and attacking his students. The encounter leaves two of them dead. The sole survivor will be whomever the Shifu spent the most time training. This marks a heel turn shift in the story's tone and a shocking and perhaps unpleasant surprise for new players. Any equipment and training time dedicated to those characters is gone now. More importantly, the loss of his students rouses emotions not previously seen in the Shifu. As a paragon of virtue, he had previously advocated for avoiding violence and mastered his art as a means of protecting others and himself and upholding justice. Now, someone has crossed a line. He knows he doesn't have much time left on Earth, and he vows before he dies to at least attempt to avenge his students' deaths. However, he doesn't want to drag his remaining student into his own vendetta, so he tries to set off on his mission alone. The surviving student, determined as much as the Shifu to avenge their peers, will tag along anyway and force the Shifu to recognize their strength. It is together that they will storm Odi Wan Lee's school, an elaborate mansion and training ground swamped with beefy students and even tigers. The back half is mostly comprised of a long boss rush. Odi Wan Lee sends his most high-ranking subordinates to fight you in pairs, supposedly to make the match fair. It is only after you defeat all of them that he will accept your challenge himself. This is the old Shifu's last stand, the one in which he will pass on his ultimate move to his remaining pupil, knowing that he can leave the world with no regrets. After overcoming this battle, he will pass away, and the chapter will end with the surviving student's visit to the gravestones of him and the other students, vowing to proudly carry on his art as the new Earthen Heart Shifu. The chapter is a massive departure from player expectations in a way that might be devastating to the average player, which presents a bit of a catch-22. The story is best experienced without spoilers, but trying to go about it spoiler-free can leave players with no way to weather the coming loss. This is probably somewhat intended on the part of the developers. You will feel the emotional loss doubly if you also stand to lose materially from it. Still, it makes the coming battles more difficult, and though a first-time player won't know it yet, it also makes the final chapter more difficult. After all, the surviving student will be the one to assume the title of Earth and Heart Shifu and appear in the Dominion of Hate with all the skills they've learned up to that point. It is paramount gameplay-wise that this student knows all the skills the old man could possibly have taught them by that point, especially if the player ends up wanting to use them in their final lineup. The difficulties presented by this twist are my only real complaints about the story, though. Narratively, I think introducing an abrupt tone change was not only a good way to subvert expectations, I would argue that it was the only way the chapter could be as good as it was. It is very easy in many circumstances for character death to be heavy-handed, especially in the case of it happening to the protagonist. In this chapter, however, the deaths of the weaker pupils accomplishes two major feats. First, it opens up a pathway for each character to develop further. Lei, Hong, and Yun all have unique arcs that correspond to whichever of them survives, which not only gives the chapter more replay value, but deepens the impact of their deaths even in subsequent playthroughs and shows the audience a whole new side of the Shifu, too. Lei's arc culminates in her resolution to use her power to fight for others rather than herself. Hong learns to view his body as a strength rather than a drawback, a surprisingly progressive notion for a 90s game to have about fat people, and Yun learns how to believe in himself enough to put his desire to protect others into practice. Additionally, this isn't very important to my overall enjoyment of the game, but I think it's kind of funny that depending on the ending, this chapter can result in the game's only female protagonist. The other thing is that it drives home the central point of the chapter, which has been built on from the moment the old man reflects on his shortening lifespan. Nothing is permanent. Human life in particular is fragile and transient. The Shifu's purpose in finding students is to ensure that the thing most important to him will outlive him and continue to serve others. When two of those students die, it is the knowledge that he doesn't have long left that allows him to act on his more reckless impulses. If he is to die soon, he decides, he might as well go down fighting and bring an end to O.D. Wan Lee's reign of terror. It is also a testament to the lasting power of good deeds and kindness. The Shifu has made a name for himself among the people of the town by using his kung fu for good, Extending the olive branch to young people who would be considered delinquent by others for making poor choices is not just a means of preserving his legacy, but a way of changing those students' lives in a way he hopes will be for the better. 
In turn, they will go on to impact others' lives positively as well, using the time that they spend in the world to create something much bigger than themselves. The death of the old Shifu himself is not altogether that surprising. He is, after all, very old and very aware that he has passed his prime. Even so, his death is something that compels players to mourn alongside his remaining student. We may have a sense that it was coming, but we're still sad about it after having watched his journey alongside his students and all the great things he did. These are the sorts of emotions a good character death is supposed to evoke. There's sadness, but the catharsis of knowing that it was appropriate and seeing other characters feel that sadness with us and carry on anyway. And the new Earth and Heart Shifu doesn't forget their mentor either. In the remake especially, whoever proceeds to the Dominion of Hate will reference the old Shifu to show that it isn't just his moves they remember. They cared about him deeply, and beyond trying to get home, they're also trying to defeat evil in the way he surely would have done. From start to finish, the Imperial China chapter shows us not just the worst of humanity, but also its best aspects, the things that make it worth loving and protecting. It shows us that people choose every step they take along their path, and they can at any point choose to do good, creating a ripple effect that will influence those around them for the better too. It is an altogether unforgettable little story, and it is no surprise to me that this chapter is many people's favorite. But Imperial China just couldn't be number one for me, which I will chalk up in part to a matter of taste. I love sci-fi. I love robot characters. I love space exploration, and I love the potential it creates for horror. If you also love all of those things, you may be as excited as I was at the prospect of a short space opera inspired by the likes of 2001 A Space Odyssey and Alien. That's right, the chapter that ticked all of my boxes was the Distant Future chapter, which centers on the small crew of a spaceship, the Cogito Ergo Sum, transporting a piece of dangerous cargo to Earth. This chapter is unique in a number of respects. You could say this about all of the chapters, sure, but this was the one I felt stood out the most. In tone, in gameplay, and in many of the elements it contained. For one thing, it is the one chapter that contains no combat at all outside of the final boss battle. The only way to practice combat is through a minigame available on an arcade machine called Captain Square. The protagonist levels up not by gaining experience, but by finding and installing machine parts. This is possible because, for another thing, the protagonist is the only non-human one in the game. Cube is a small spherical robot created by a member of the spaceship crew to be a helper, and named ironically on purpose. All of the crew members are named after lead characters in other sci-fi media, and players can find many nods to sci-fi cinema throughout the chapter as well. It starts with Kato, Cube's creator, registering them as a proper member of the crew and telling them to rouse the rest of the members from cryogenic stasis. Cube finds that their reception is mostly positive. The exception is Corporal Darth, a military veteran nursing a deep grudge against robots. Having fought in a war some years ago against Rogue AI, he claims that robots can't be trusted, and Cube's demonstrations of good faith are met with hostility. In general, the Corporal is gruff, insensitive, and not very likable. He doesn't have any friends among the crew. After all, he's only here as a military escort to ensure the goods on board reach their destination safely. To that end, he doesn't need to be pleasant. From a player perspective, this makes him the perfect red herring. It's not long after Cube wakes up when things start to go wrong. Burst communications are cut. The ship's antenna is malfunctioning, and the only way to fix it is by sending a couple of crewmates out in spacesuits to repair it manually. Kirk and Kato take on the task, but before they can complete it, Kirk's suit malfunctions, causing him to suffocate. A trip to the med bay isn't enough to revive him, and tensions rise as accusations are flung back and forth between the remaining crew members. Huey and Kirk had a falling out over their mutual love for Rachel, so didn't Huey have a believable motive to sabotage the suit? Amidst all the arguing, the sound of an explosion rings through the hallways, and it is only later that the consequences of this become apparent. The cargo is out. This is where things become truly scary for poor Q. The dangerous cargo was an alien behemoth, a giant four-legged beast with just enough intelligence to resent its captors. Cube must flee before the angry beast kills them, and the latter half of the chapter is spent trying to avoid it as it lurks in the halls and triggers various chase scenes. The amount of factors to worry about only seems to increase as time goes on. When Kirk finally gives up the ghost, Rachel goes mad and refuses to leave his corpse alone until she believes that he is sending her messages, telling her that he is still outside the ship. She desperately tries to fling herself out of the airlock to be with him, nearly killing the others in the process. Then the crew discovers that the reason they've been unable to contact their captain despite the pandemonium is because the captain has been dead all along, his corpse locked inside his quarters. He evidently suffered the same fate as Kirk, asphyxiation. He has been dead for a while, too. All the briefings the crew had gotten up to that point were pre-recorded. It becomes harder to tell who could have orchestrated all of these problems happening at once, but the pieces start to fall into place when Cube encounters a doppelganger of themselves, poised dangerously in front of a gravely wounded Kato. 
As the imposter is about to attack Cube, Darth bursts in, leveling a gun. In order to determine which one is the real Cube, Kato asks a question only they would know. What was the first name he proposed for them? Of course, the player should know this, and upon giving a correct answer, Darth will destroy the imposter. The twist that has been foreshadowed for much of the chapter is finally revealed. The one who released the behemoth, cut off communications, sabotaged Kirk's suit, killed the captain, and turned the remaining crew against each other was the ship itself. More specifically, the Cogito Ergo Sum's AI, Decimus, also known as OD-10 or the Murther Matrix. OD-10 was created to be a ship's aid, monitoring the conditions on board and ensuring the crew remained safe. However, after witnessing the discord between the crew members, it determined that the greatest threat to the crew was not aliens or airlock malfunctions, but the crew themselves. Contradictory as this may seem, OD-10 seems fully intent on eliminating the remainder of the crew, including Cube. The only way to stop it is to hack into its programming and forcibly shut it down, and the only port left from which to do that is none other than the Captain Square machine that players may have experimented with before. Cube must upload themselves into the game and then use its mechanics to destroy OD-10 and prevent it from doing further harm. Doing so wins them the lasting gratitude of the few remaining crew, including the unexpected respect of Corporal Darth, who, behind his poor attitude, had no ill intent after all. Cube is able to make it to Earth, and people begin to consider how to improve their relationships with AI in the long term. This chapter is an easy sell for people who like sci-fi horror in general. Those who've played and enjoyed the myriad indie RPG maker horror titles on the market will probably like it too. Combat is practically non-existent, and dangerous encounters are basically an immediate game over, which means players must think on their feet and prioritize running and hiding over powering through obstacles with brute force. The crew is also trapped on the ship with no way to seek help and no way to leave and find a safer place. Being stuck in close quarters with co-workers for so long is bound to cause tension on a good day, but when a murder mystery crops up, what little trust exists between those present crumbles to dust. The root cause of the threat is completely unclear until almost the end, and the one behind that evil was all along something that no one could touch or destroy by conventional means, which is the most frightening part. Slashers may be scary because the killer can't be understood or reasoned with, but monsters and similar entities are scary because they can't be killed. This is also what makes the character of Cube shine. They are a contrast to the entire mood that takes drastic turns for the worst. While nearly everyone around them descends into conflict and accusations are flung left and right, Cube tries to mediate and prevent things from getting worse. They put themselves into dangerous situations to ensure the safety of the others, and even when they fail or are spurned by an increasingly paranoid crew, they keep up their duties at the risk of their own mechanical life. It is fitting that they are the only one who can confront OD-10 at the end. Not only is it something only a machine can do, but it is a way of affirming the stance that humans are worth protecting. People are worth protecting even when they do the wrong thing. It makes me think that, particularly at the time the chapter was written, it wasn't meant to be any sort of statement about the future of AI and potential rights that would have to come with sentience. It's the chapter that best demonstrates the game's overall message because Cube's victory is a symbolic one, too. It's not a victory of humanity over AI or of the weak over the strong. It's a victory of hope over cynicism. Cube may not be human, but they were designed by a kind human and made to represent some of humanity's best qualities. Optimism, determination, generosity, resourcefulness, and above all, love. Can Cube feel all of those things the same way we do? We can't know for sure, but the simple act of kindness and bringing coffee to crewmates who are feeling despondent speaks volumes. In contrast, OD-10 was full of hate for people. It was conniving, cruel, and murderous to the point of defying its own logic. Cube overpowering OD-10 can be read as a statement that it isn't just important to hold on to hope and faith in others during dark times. It is, as a matter of fact, the only way we can survive. If there's a complaint I have about this chapter, it's a mechanical issue that has already been fixed in the remake. I've already mentioned that in the older version of Live Alive, none of the chapters have maps. The Cogito Ergo Sum may just be a spaceship, but it still has a lot of ground to cover, and the twisting hallways can be confusing, especially when trying to outrun a bloodthirsty alien. The remake not only adds a map, but includes map markers that allow players to see where they need to go to trigger the next story flag. It's such a small thing, but it makes the gameplay that much easier and allows people to enjoy the story more smoothly. So there you have it. I think that Cube's chapter is the best one that Live Alive has, and that I would have felt the same whether I'd played it in a different order or not. It's ironic that the indomitable will of the human spirit is exemplified best through a mostly mute robot, but that's not really the point. The point is that people were meant to find strength in others, and by turning others away out of distrust or disdain, it is all too easy to become lonely, paranoid, and hateful. 
I didn't consider Orsted's chapter among these rankings because it's so heavily tied to the underlying narrative of the whole game, and stands out from the rest in terms of tone, length, and in some respects quality as well. Yet my criticism of the remake has to do with Orsted too. It's a small one, but one that I think is significant. The game got revamped art and brand new illustrations by Naoki Ikushima. They look great, and I love the attention to detail in all of them. However, those who had played Live Alive before noticed a glaring problem with the cover art. It spoils Orsted's very existence. This may not seem like a big deal, but Orsted's chapter isn't revealed until all the other seven have been completed for a reason. To have him shown in both the trailer and on the cover raises questions in the uninitiated, especially because his chapter is still inaccessible in the remake until the prerequisites have been met. I was told that I shouldn't even watch the trailer until I was done with the game, and now I understand why. It was better that until the end I didn't know about Orsted at all. Even if this destroyed any streaming expectations of when the actual end of the game would be, it made for a much more exciting and memorable experience. Most other criticisms of the remake from fans of the original version have to do with the matter that always manages to get fans of Japanese games angry. Localization. As I watched a playthrough of the remake, I went back through corresponding footage of the original to double-check for differences, and, as I said, I didn't find any worth mentioning outside of the ending. I had to use Eon Genesis's fan translation patch, which was perfectly serviceable and, as I understand it, the commonly used one among existing Live Alive fans. That said, some aspects of it were also dated. Whether based on the whim of the translators or the Japanese text itself, I can't be sure. There were a handful of jokes and remarks that demonstrated pretty typical 90s sexism which were toned down for a modern audience. Despite the Wild West chapter taking place in a saloon, references to drinking and smoking were minimized as well, possibly to fit within updated ESRB guidelines. Most of this is in the form of item names being changed. A couple of notable examples are Sundown getting stat boosts from jerky instead of cigars, and the piece of equipment he can steal from Annie as a diary instead of her underwear. I wouldn't call any of this wildly out of line, nor would I refer to it as censorship. My opinion on localization is and always has been that it's meant to get across a given meaning in a way that makes sense to an intended audience, rather than making direct and literal translations. Japanese to English localization often takes into account cultural differences, idioms, and how people actually talk in English. Sometimes this isn't done well and the original meaning is twisted or removed outright, but Live Alive's official translation doesn't have such egregious changes from the fan-made one that anything important gets lost. In some places, the translator's creative liberties make the dialogue flow more smoothly. In others, I noticed that any concerns about censorship fly right out the window because the game is still plenty vulgar and suggestive. Many of the characters, especially Akira, swear frequently. Zaki the caveman still wears nothing but a lizard to cover his crotch, and Pogo's chapter is still full of fart jokes and embarrassing references to puberty. Nothing was really sacrificed to bring this game to English-speaking audiences, and certainly none of the crassness that accounted for plenty of its humor. Virtually everything else about the remake was a straightforward improvement. Many modern remakes of older video games are concerned with making the graphics more realistic and high resolution, but Live Alive's fresh new HD 2D graphics maintain the fidelity of the original's pixel art style while adding layers of depth to the environment and exploration of it. In addition, the UI is much more intuitive. Move selection, equipment, and navigation are more fluid and streamlined than in the original. Instructions and tutorials are provided at certain points where there were none two decades ago, and now there are area maps as well, making it much more difficult for players to get lost. I already outlined some of the major mechanical problems in each chapter that were easily fixed in the remake just by adding a directional tip or two. All in all, it's an experience that's more engaging and less frustrating. I also have to comment on the sound design. The original OST for the game was good and maintains its own retro charm. However, Yoko Shimamura's rearranges show both a love for her older work and an ear for what works best with modern sound systems. From the jazzy pieces in the near future chapter to the percussive prehistory chapter's beats, all feel like they fit, and some will have you bouncing in your seat as you clear out enemies. As for the voice acting, Live Alive never had that to begin with, so for it to get voiceovers in both Japanese and English is a pretty big deal. I think the casting was also, for the most part, pretty well done. Performance varied a bit among the actors, but my impressions were mostly positive. I was pleasantly surprised at just how much the voice acting covered, including unique lines for special moves. Even one-off minor characters got voiced too, a fact which notably got Sugi to Tomokazu, the voice of characters like Krom in Fire Emblem Awakening and Yusuke in Persona 5, and a longtime fan of Live Alive, a role as a minor character in every chapter. He wanted very badly to be a part of this remake, so I have to say it's as heartwarming as it is amusing that he was able to juggle so many roles.
Keeping all of this in mind, if I were to recommend a way to experience Live Alive for the first time to people, I would say that the remake is almost certainly the better way to do it. You'll probably find yourself stuck less often, as the game is more open about telling you what you need to do, and there are buffs that have made the stages straight up easier. You'll get treated to more impressive graphics and new art, as well as Shimomura's updated musical stylings. The only problem for some may be the price. Live Alive was remade for the Switch exclusively. Those without a Switch, or who would rather play it on a PC or something, won't find it accessible. Additionally, Nintendo games don't tend to get that much cheaper. The last used copy I saw at GameStop was still 45 United States dollars. For some, that's just not affordable. Although I won't publicly share any of the more dubious means of acquiring a copy, I will say that if you can't pay for the remake, the original Super Famicom fan translation is still out there somewhere, and it still holds up pretty well. That is, after all, how I first played the game myself. It is clunkier, less elegant in design, and may require guides to get through. However, I generally advocate that if people want to experience Live Alive, it's something they ought to play themselves rather than seeking out someone else's playthrough. Additionally, as much as I dislike a lot of Nintendo's bottom-line policies, I tend to favor buying remakes in the specific case of games that are more obscure or overlooked. Live Alive was an old SNES title with no translation and a small audience that wouldn't include non-Japanese speakers at all if not for the translation patch. Additionally, it performed terribly on the market, only ever selling 270,000 copies during its entire lifetime. Many were surprised to see it get a remake. How many games like it, older titles that were never localized, are forgotten? How many games never sold well when they first came out and will never be experienced by modern audiences because of that? It stands to reason that when games like these are remade, sales are watched closely to determine whether games like them are worth investing in. Many people wonder why there are so many remakes of games that have been commercially milked to death already. Put bluntly, money talks. It is safer to invest in what is already popular than to work on developing a title people may not care about at all. It's why Persona 3 recently got a remake announced, and why, as excited as I and other fans are about it, we know it means Persona 1 and 2 will continue to languish because they're not as easy to market. Live Alive was rescued from the annals of video game history by people who obviously cared very much about what they were making. The only way games like it will continue to get similar treatment no matter how old or obscure they are will be if people buy them. So, with all of that in mind, I'll close with this. Live Alive is not the best game I've ever played. It is not my favorite, but it is easily one of the most unique and one of the most memorable. It has gone on to inspire much more popular titles like Chrono Trigger, Bravely Default, and even Undertale. Its small but dedicated following in the West has helped prove that Japanese games have an audience here, which allowed for the localization of countless titles from Cave Story to the Like a Dragon series. To this day, there is not only no other game that so seamlessly blurs the lines of genre into a tapestry of humanity's best and worst qualities, but I've never seen another game even attempt it. It's the sort of game I would recommend to almost anyone, if only because everyone who likes games can probably find something that they like in it, or spot a connection between it and something else that they loved. After all, to know what went into something that's important to you is to love it all the more.